finish up your poll responses. Um, thank you. Wonderful. OK, so it's 1 o'clock here in the East Coast. Um, so thank you very much for being here. It's really wonderful to have you here. And we appreciate the early engagement. Please keep it up. We're very excited to see everyone participating in chat and sharing uh, your experiences and where you work and your questions. Um, all of that in the chat it makes it really a lot more fun and engaging. And we hope that you'll keep it up. Uh, we're very happy to see so many people who care about veterans here and some veterans, as well as people who are members of our Columbia community. So thank you very much for being here. And thank you also to our volunteer speakers, uh, Rachel Waltz and Lieutenant Colonel Franklin Swain, for donating their time to be here. So thank you. All right, so I'm going to do a very quick introduction to Adobe Connect, just in case there are folks here who have not used this platform before, but it'll be very quick. I'm going to end these two polls and switch over so that the slide is a little bit easier to see. So if you're using Google Chrome, it may be that um, you're going to experience some issues. So if you log out and log back in using any other browser, um, they all play better with Adobe Connect than Chrome. If, when we say log out and log back in, that just means close your browser window. And please do type all throughout the session. Some people worry that we're going to think you're being rude or something, but no, we love it. So please um, keep up the chat. If you want the chat to be bigger, just so it's easier for you to read, all you have to do is go over to where it says chat at the top, and then go across to this menu icon. And when you click on that, you'll see the option to change your text size. And that will make it more accessible to everybody if you want to have a larger text size. And we'll be asking some polls. Some of you have already responded to polls. Uh, and we often get asked, how do I respond to a poll? So if there's a box to type in, you type, and then you click on this or click Enter. If there are circles, that means you pick one and you just click on it. And if there's boxes, you can pick more than one, um, as many as apply. And then you'll know that it's worked because it'll say the answer is submitted, or you'll see your, you've had an effect. Either there'll be a circle there, or there'll be a check mark. All right, so that's our intro to Adobe Connect. And with that, I'd like to welcome on Mary Leah Coxawanahara, our Director of Marketing and Communications. And she's going to introduce Rachel Waltz. <coughs> Hi, everyone. Thank you, Mintia. Um, I'm Mary Leah Cox Awanohar, Director of Marketing and Communications for Columbia University's School of Social Work. And the very best thing about my job here is getting to talk to the brilliant alumni of the school. Many of them are doing amazing things with their MSW degrees, and I've become convinced the MSW is a really versatile degree. And that's actually why I started up this event series. I wanted our alumni to be able to share their stories with us. And today's featured guest, Rachel Waltz, is a great example of that. Hi, Rachel. Welcome. Hi, Mary Leah. Thanks for having me. Thanks for agreeing to being featured today. And um, Rachel and I actually have one thing in common that I have to mention, which is that we are both Delaware? <laughs> what are the odds of that? Um, and of course, we're both used to hearing the question, what state is that in? Um, <laughs> so yeah, it's funny to us. I think the best way for me to introduce you, Rachel, is through the little video we made when you visited our office that tells about your work and highlights what you do. Is that OK? Yeah, that's a great place to start. I've been working with veterans, and predominantly veterans who have uh, histories of housing instability for about four years now. That statistic is really what brought about a lot of the different housing programs and employment programs that are out there today. And through some of those efforts, we've been able to reduce veteran homelessness by about 35%. I would say the fact that I'm a civilian and very mindful of that um, kind of forces me to 
help them help each other more to call on their brothers and sisters because they're going to know in some ways um, the things that might be triggering for them or some resources that that may be in place that I may not know about um, and so anything that I can do to help reduce that isolation uh, and to increase and to kind of build on some of that existing camaraderie that they've had in service I'm gonna make sure I do. Housing is monumental. If you don't have a physical address that you can put on your resume, an employer is gonna be less likely to hire you. If you don't have a clean bathroom to shave or shower or check your appearance or hang your clothing, an employer is gonna be less likely to hire you. It's gonna be harder to do anything without a safe, stable place to call home. The advice that I would have for someone who's contemplating working with veterans as a civilian is to make that commitment to continue our, our own education and our own training, um, but also be open to, to being curious about what that culture and what that experience means to, to the veteran. Working alongside, but also serving folks who have served this country. I mean, there's, I feel like there's no greater honor than being able to, to work with these men and women. Well, that was powerful and moving, Rachel. <laughs> Um, you guys did a nice job. I would like to exercise. Oh, thank you. Um, I'd like to exercise my power as the one non-specialist participant today to ask you three quick questions uh, before Franklin Swain gets in and takes over. Um, first, I have to confess I have this romantic image of a soldier coming back from war and being greeted warmly by their family and being showered with laurels and um, embraced and being told they're a hero. And somehow um, the idea that they end up homeless doesn't compute with that image. And I find it actually a shock that that happens. I, I know you worked with the homeless in Brooklyn before you worked with homeless veterans. Um, did you find it a shock? Yeah, Mary Leah, um, that's, a, that's a great question. I do want to throw a quick disclaimer in that the opinions that I express are um, my own and not any official position of the U.S. government. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a shame that um, despite the resources that we have in this country, that there continue to be uh, homeless uh, veterans and unstably housed vets in this country. Um, you know, when I graduated from CSSW, I went to work at Neighbors Together, which is a community-based program based in Brooklyn, and I had the opportunity to work with a lot of um, homeless and unstably housed men and women. Um, sorry, I'm getting a bit of an ad right now. Um, but. Uh. I'm sorry, I'm getting a bit of an audio something. OK. Sorry. Um, I'm just going to not listen to it for a minute. All right, sorry about that. Um, that was a weird ad. But uh, yes, yeah, so when I worked at Neighbors Together, I worked predominantly with uh, homeless men um, who didn't have access to medical or mental health care, didn't have sufficient income to uh, get housing. And so the rare times I did come across a veteran, it was kind of like hitting the jackpot. Uh, they were able to access treatment at the VA. They often had income due to a VA pension or VA disability. And so um, when I moved down south and started working exclusively with veterans, ah. I saw the way that pre-military factors really impacted the way someone came home. Uh, for example, one of the young female vets I worked with uh, was placed in foster care when she was 10 years old and separated from her siblings. And so at 17 and a half, um, she enlisted in the service uh, just to get out of that situation. And six years later when she came home, um, 
she didn't have a stable place. Uh, she stayed with a friend's mom, and when that didn't work out, um, she became homeless. Yeah, and, and another question I have for you is I've observed in doing this series that vets are a tightly knit group, and they feel that outsiders can't really understand their culture, that it's unique. How does a non-vet uh, break into that? circle and say, I, I want to help you. And I guess the question inside my question is, what advice do you have for non-vets who would like to do military social work? Yeah. Um, you know, as a civilian, uh, you know, my father served Vietnam era, but military culture was not part of my world growing up. And so uh, about five years ago, when I moved from New York down to North Carolina, you know, we're crossing the state line and we see the big sign that says, welcome to North Carolina, um, most military friendly state. And I was like, where the heck are we moving to? Uh, and so I very quickly had to immerse myself in culture down there. Um, as I made friends, I met more and more veterans um, and just noticed differences in the language folks used, um, uh, in the activities they participated in. A lot of those guys uh, were big CrossFitters. Um, and so when I started working at the VA, I was really able to depend upon my colleagues who were also veterans to help with my learning experience. And so the uh, advice I would have is, number one, find out what you're passionate about and do that work well so that you can bring that to the individual uh, vets that you may work with. Number two, ask your veterans what their preferences are and you let that guide the work you do. And number three, just spend time with vets um, outside of the context of work and observe and ask questions and notice how events may impact them, um, you know, like the recent 9-11 uh, anniversary we've had. Oh, oh! Did we lose Rachel? <laughs> uh, no, um, we didn't hear Rachel. Go ahead and ask the next question, Raylia. Okay. Yeah. Um. My last question is. Um. I know you've been working for the Veterans Association for Administration. Sorry, for the last four years, and that coincides with President Obama's second term when he had an, an initiative to end homelessness for veterans. Have you observed? A difference from when you started working for the VA to now has has it made a difference his initiative? Yeah, I've I've really seen that big reduction in chronic homeless uh, homelessness uh, borne out. You know, when I first started working at the VA, I was lucky to participate in some uh, community meetings um, where I was sitting around the table with other stakeholders, and they would introduce me to veterans, and we'd literally go out to campsites. Um, where veterans had a lot of survival skills, but were literally living in the woods. And so um, as a result of that, I was able to work with someone, help him find a place to live, help connect him with uh, resources. And so in the last four years, um, I've come across many fewer chronically homeless vets. Um, and the folks who do come in our door, we have a lot more to offer them. Oh, that's good. Well, thank you for this introduction to Rachel's work and to Rachel. And with this, I'd like to welcome up Lieutenant Colonel Frank Swain, who's one of our online instructors here at the School of Social Work. And good afternoon. Everybody, you can hear me and see me OK? Yes. OK, great. Hey, thanks for the introduction. I do want to in person, been chatting with many of you, just want to welcome you in person. I am Franklin Swain. I'm an active duty Air Force social worker stationed in Colorado Springs, Colorado. So welcome from uh, the beautiful state of Colorado. Uh, in addition, I'm actually honored to serve as an adjunct professor for Columbia School of Social Work. I actually had the opportunity to teach a course on social work in the military. Uh, a neat opportunity uh, to add to the uh, great uh, experience of Columbia University social work training to talk about how to relate to veterans uh, and active duty members without having been a service member yourself. One example uh, that we often give in our class is to meet a veteran or a military family and say, where are you from, is to already create a barrier. Uh, where I'm from as a military member is uh, as diverse as Puerto Rico, Florida, Hawaii, Germany, England. But to say where's home for you is a great opportunity for them to just tell you where they feel like they've gotten some roots. But I also have a disclaimer today. The views and opinions that I offer today are not a reflection of the US Air Force or the Department of Defense. I just want to make sure everyone's aware on that.
But we do have a great opportunity today to talk about a transitioning uh, from the military and the ways to mitigate the risk of homelessness for veterans. So actually, first slide, one thing to discuss is what is the definition of a veteran? Uh, if you read along with me, you can actually see that uh, it means old, of course, uh, in Latin there, thanks to Wikipedia. But for the Department of Defense and the Department of Veteran Affairs, there actually is no standard legalized definition of a military veteran. Uh, it's it's something we all have to deal with and, and make you aware of. Uh, there's never been a point where our country has clearly defined veteran. It's just over the course of uh, over 200 years in our country, as Congress creates new laws and addresses matters, then that's how you determine where someone is eligible. Technically, a veteran can be someone who even served less than a month and was medically boarded up to 30 years and somebody had a criminal action and maybe doesn't get benefits but could still be considered a veteran. Interesting enough on that. Um, they are, both agencies, the Department of Defense and Veterans Administration, are certainly well aware of the homelessness issue and have, are seeking to address how to answer those challenges that are faced by the men and women leaving active duty service. Second slide, uh, just to make you aware of some terms that may come up in our discussion today, Anyone that leaves active duty service will be given a DD-214. That's the official certificate of discharge from active duty service. Uh, in fact, when dealing with homeless, uh, it's not uh, uncommon that they may have lost their DD-214, uh, their social security card, or identification. So I even put a link on there on how any veteran can get a hold of their DD-214. In reference to that first slide, uh, the DD-214 helps demonstrate what resources that uh, veteran could be eligible for. The other thing the Department of Defense has done, just want to make everyone aware, is that they have mandated, Congress has mandated for the Department of Defense to have anyone separating or retiring from the military to, uh, to uh, attend a week-long transition assistant program called TAPS. The development of TAPS, like I said, was mandated for anyone leaving the service, and it is it is a great opportunity for every service member to re, to uh, review the benefits and the education and dedicated uh, uh, services and programs that are available for them. Also during that time, the Department of Labor, as well as the Housing and Urban Development, have representatives in that week-long briefing to help assess and even serve those who may be facing challenges in their transition with employment and or housing. Uh, and then the last thing I'll just touch on is that there's a program available called In Transition, and I've given you all a link. It is set for any individual who has been touched with the military, touched, served in the military, to be provided uh, coaching, empowering, connecting, especially in the area of mental health. So we're really looking to make sure that there's never anyone that falls through the cracks with just those two programs them, them, themselves, TAPS and In Transition. So just want to do that baseline coverage because uh, now we're going to get the opportunity to transition. To, Rachel and I want to spend some time chatting together, but also chatting with you, uh, participants, in regards to uh, the discussion about homelessness and veterans. So actually, if we could bring, uh, I'd like to invite Rachel back up. Good to see you, Rachel. Uh, thanks hey, for uh, thanks for the chance to chat with you today. You know, we're going to have that opportunity to talk about social connections, how they exist uh, when transitioning out of the military, maybe the triggers that individuals can have, especially if it's going to lead toward them being actually impoverished when they leave the military and maybe even how to use our social work skills when working with veterans. Uh, so for the participants, we're going to be watching the chat, uh, and we've made arrangements to stick around a little bit after the official end of time if there's extended discussion needed. Anyway, Rachel, good to see you. I think we actually have something in common, do we not? We sure do. We, uh, we both hold our social work licenses from the great state of North Carolina. <laughs> we were discussing the fact that uh, I think North Carolina requires more CEUs than most other states. So that's probably we, a good thing. That's fair, and we welcome those, including myself, that will get CEUs for today. So, that's right. <laughs> so you know, um, in looking at this perspective, you know, again, Ra Rachel, honored to have you because you are working with the homeless. But we want to take a look at who that we've been chatting with folks. But let's go ahead and throw a survey up, and this will be your chance, everyone's chance to participate. Let's take a look at uh, who is participating, what you bring to the uh, – to the chat. So if you will, as you're voting, just quickly, some of your, wow, you guys are already on it. 
What's your <laughs> experience with veterans who are homeless? Okay, give a few moments there, a few more moments. Great. You know, Rachel, it looks like uh, almost uh, right at 40% are individuals here to learn, which is fantastic. And then we certainly value those seven folks who are saying that they have reached a pro status, which is meaning the, the art and science of dealing with yep. a myriad of issues around homelessness. So what are your thoughts in regards to what it takes to be successful in working with the homeless? Um, yeah, that's, that's a great question, Franklin. And I kind of alluded to this earlier about um, really kind of starting where, uh, you know, the veteran is um, really honing our engagement skills, um, but letting that individual that we're working with guide, guide the work that we do. Yeah, absolutely. So for someone who is uh, still trying to learn, and this is something you know, I, I kind of threw out the example a moment ago of not saying where are you from, uh, but where's home for you, um, there's a consideration too about uh, that shift from camaraderie uh, and the unit and the military focus to actually being on your own. Uh, I'll build on that. The consideration I see for people who are transitioning is they really miss like I said, the camaraderie, but there's also that, that uh, independence and personal strength thing that they try and teach in the military, that if homeless, it must be stripped away from you, that idea that I can take care of myself or, or that I'm independent and strong and resilient. And I think, you know, folks have a variety of experiences during their time in service, and I think that also plays a big part. You know, did someone uh, spend six months or a year in and get a medical discharge? Um, they're going to have a different level of military uh, acculturation than someone who maybe served 20 years um, and, and served multiple tours and, and just came out and, and found that the world that they remembered is, is not the world of today. Oh, yeah, great point. Yep, I think we've got a second poll. I'm going to, I'll yield that one to you and then we can chat a, a little bit more. Yeah, that sounds good. Um, so the next question um, is how are veterans who are homeless different from civilians who are homeless? And if uh, folks can just take a minute and check all that apply. See a couple of different responses coming in now. That's great. Yep, so folks really kind of cluing into into gender. Um, uh, see some stuff there around mental health issues. Yeah, you, Great. yeah let's take a look um, at that. So um, go ahead. Yeah, so um, I see, uh, you know, a big response for folks is that, um, you know, veterans who are homeless are, are predominantly male. Um, and a big part of that just has to do with the, the veteran population at large right now. Um, you know, that population is uh, continuing to shift. I just saw a report out recently that, um, that found that our veteran population is uh, becoming more and more like our civilian population as a whole in terms of uh, gender and race and ethnicity. Um, but historically, yes, the, the veteran population has predominantly been uh, a little bit older, um, uh, male, uh, not, you know, white, non-Hispanic. Um, I also see the piece there about about mental illness. Um, Franklin, I'm wondering kind of what your thoughts are about that piece. Yeah, thank you. I was going to jump on. That's another aspect very is certainly watching in the transition. Uh, even even now with that part of TAPS and the out processing, there's a medical requirement to be evaluated uh, upon departure. Now it can involve, and this is a little bit of a catch here. It can involve. Uh, a survey in which individuals may choose to not answer correctly in regards to have you been experiencing anxiety, depression, uh, thoughts of self-harm. Uh, obviously, if a person doesn't answer uh, correctly or feels uh, scared to answer truthfully, then it can limit the amount of uh, help and services they get. But there's no question, too, that the military has lots of protective factors, but risk factors can include that of mental illness to include, which we would all expect, uh, some post-traumatic stress for those who may uh, well have been in deployed settings. So it's a great catch for individuals to note that that mental illness would certainly be an impact. You know, there's there's something new in the discussion uh, of among social workers in the military that I actually bring up to you, Rachel, and the concept for the individuals who are participating today, and that's the term lost glory. 
Uh, I alluded to it in the first poll, but uh, what I'll tell you, this, and again, this is really newer stuff here, but again, the idea of lost glory is that for the military, we're all into pomp and circumstance and ceremony and medals and, you know, rank. And, and so there is this idea of I am something larger than myself and I am, you know, doing well in it. And so that departure from the military or um, being put out of the military because of some misbehavior or, or um, illegal aspects or to even be removed from what's called a reduction in force. In other mm -hmm. words, the military no longer needs this amount of people, so you're now a civilian. That lost glory aspect can really be a cultural challenge for individuals. Your thoughts yeah. on that term? Yeah, it's, you know, uh, Franklin, um, you know, this is the first I'm hearing of that term, but I've absolutely seen that borne out. Um, you know, I've worked with a young veteran who, um, you know, was a staff sergeant, um, you know, ran PT drills for, uh, you know, for his team, um, was in great physical shape and then got injured in service and came out um, and, you know, could barely get up and play with his young kids. And it's, it's tough to watch, and it's um, and it can be challenging to help folks uh, kind of reframe their role in in their family and, and in this world as they try to um, you know reengage and, and find you know find another kind of aspect of themselves to, to be proud of. Yeah, I I'm I'm really glad that they're bringing up this term. I can't own it myself. I'm taking it from someone else, but <laughs> but it is such an interesting way to look at the matter that if someone has been extremely successful, perhaps we're leading many people and doing amazing things, and then one day the culture says you're now done. Uh, they could have really been wrapped up in that their identity is their job or what they did. And then to find themselves in a totally different financial uh, st st status, social setting can really put them into a spin to include homelessness uh, because of their lack of preparing for the post-military experience. But you know, um, actually, uh, we're now starting to talk about how our social work skills are getting uh, involved with this population, including that term of lost glory. So I'll actually put up another poll uh, for those who are participating. Let's take a, take a look at the fourth question. Now, don't get overwhelmed. There's a lot of them on there, so we'll give you a moment. You can you, you can just pick your top three as we look through it. For those who are interested, what social work skills do you think are most helpful for working with veterans? And then uh, Rachel and I, who both have that opportunity, like many of you have uh, put on the chat, are also doing, it will just be a great point to consider. What do you think is the top aspects as we look at uh, those individuals? So uh, Rachel, you and I will do this. This is great. It's all uh, in real time kind of stuff here. Uh, oh, yeah. and, then, great. and thankfully, it does the math for us, because I don't know about you, but <laughs> Most social workers don't do so well in math, so. I was, I was just going to say, I always get in trouble for saying um, math is math is not my strong suit. Yeah, understood. Um, you know, I'm just going to grab right there toward the top. Meeting people where they are and listening without judgment sounds like mm -hmm. phenomenal sound general general social work, doesn't it? Absolutely, absolutely. And, I, and I'm seeing in the chat a lot of conversation about stigma, specifically uh, regarding uh, mental health issues and substance use. And so really being able to engage folks um, and, and kind of be open to you know, how someone may have arrived at, at the things they're struggling with now is, is critically important. And I think uh, the numbers are still moving around, but uh, I also like that we're catching that a trauma-informed perspective can be Respectful. I like to call it the art of social work. You know, we, we've got the theory, we've got the uh, practice, but just to meet with that individual and at that moment being mindful of just empathizing and normalizing, not judging, means that we get to be the right person, right skills, right time to either interact with them or refer them into the right right place. So uh, I, I'm impressed with everyone's folks, uh, uh, everyone's perspective on that. And then again, that's part of this workshop is just to make folks aware of where they can refer somebody when working with them. So you know, the story I would offer too is, I, I will touch on it again, is just that chance that I knew of a fighter pilot who uh, lost uh, the ability to be a pilot because of medical conditions, and then the the, the no chance for um, continuing as what he enjoys doing, which is flying, no chance for civilian employment, I had not made wise financial decisions during their service time, and it resulted in just an extreme drop uh, in self-concept and abilities, 
And of course, one of the bigger challenges would be that he starts medicating, well, I'd call it self-medicating self through mm -hmm. alcohol. So uh, that can also be a, a competing issue, wouldn't you say, when they start uh, looking at using substances to cope uh, or, uh, again, not having the financial abilities to get on their feet. Uh, would, go ahead. I was going to say, absolutely. I, you know, thinking, you know, broadly, I would say one of the most consistent symptoms I see for folks is just difficulty with sleep. Um, so whether that's because of nightmares from PTSD, um, whether, uh, you know, that's auditory stimulation, um, there's just, you know, I see disrupted sleep, um, you know, depression, you know, difficulty getting to sleep, anxiety, disrupted sleep in the middle of the night, and, you know, Alcohol or other substances may, you know, folks may turn to that to assist with the getting to sleep process, um, but it really can end up, uh, you know, harming folks in the long run. Yeah, I, and so that's certainly something to consider is that the homeless situation is not just that they didn't make good financial choices. It isn't that they're just drinking. It is a really multifaceted aspect, yes? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And, and I would also say that, um, context is hugely important. I mean, we have an affordable housing crisis here in New York City, and you know, folks can't maintain a safe, stable place to live without that housing being affordable. Absolutely, I, I know that's true in some of the other areas too, such as uh, San Francisco. So we have veterans that are just even priced out of any chance for finding stable housing. That's a great point. Well, we actually have a, a fourth poll, right? Yep, we've got one. I think one more. Okay. So it's popping up here in just a moment. All right. So the our last poll is uh, which of the following are associated with successful permanent housing programs? And you can check all that apply. Great transition from what we were chatting about. So we'll take a look at what people say. Yep. Talking about a problem, now trying to focus on some solutions. All right, we're starting to see a good mix uh, coming in. Um, looks like there's an overwhelming um, focus on uh, having reactive or crisis-oriented support services, um, which is interesting because that means that we'll we'll get a chance to learn a little bit today. Excellent. Um, yeah, um, yeah. So we actually, um, you know. I, I work in a program that uh, really comes from what's called a housing first perspective and we use a lot of harm reduction which means that um, and the evidence backs us up that uh, you know once you engage someone who's homeless um, the, the fastest thing we want to do is get them into um, safe housing um, and so if we don't put a lot of barriers around that you know regarding uh, being sober or working or providing service, but just getting someone into housing and getting them um, accustomed to uh, paying, you know, rent that's considered affordable again, um, making sure that they uh, have the same, you know, tenancy rights and responsibilities as, as the rest of us. So they've got to be paying their rent on time. They've got to be a good neighbor. Um, is going to help reduce that isolation that Franklin talked about earlier. Um, but that piece around reactivity and kind of responding to crisis all the time, I think as social workers, uh, sometimes we can feel like we just end up putting out fires. And um, <laughs> unfortunately, sometimes that, that leads the folks that we're working with to only to kind of bump up that threshold so that the only time they act is when things end up being too late. And so if we can... Um, build a little bit more planning into into helping folks address maybe when there's warning signs regarding sobriety or warning signs if, hey, you know you're not going to be able to pay rent this month, rather than ignoring that, give your landlord a call. Um, tell him, yeah. him or her what's going on um, and, and building a plan so that we're not just putting out fires. You know, I'm interested because it's a great point. Do you feel like, uh, you know, almost feels counterintuitive that you say sobriety and work aren't requirements up front? Uh, mm -hmm. But but that's a perception. Uh, it, it is actually intuitive to go ahead and let them find somewhere to live without attacking, addressing the sobriety issue first. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I, and I think we've even learned from like the tobacco cessation research that um, you know folks sometimes fail at maintaining abstinence ten times before they succeed. And so we don't necessarily know you know when is someone going to be successful at that. But if they can have a stable place over their head in the meanwhile to um, 
again, to store their medication, to wash their clothes, um, you know, all of those things are going to build motivation for um, achieving sobriety. Yeah, for, uh, I mean, when we look at general social work, we're talking about Maslow's aspects, but uh, again, I think there would have been, so I've learned something in preparing for this with you, that, you know, sobriety is not the, the primary, it is literally getting them somewhere safe where they can lay their head, so that's a great point. A uh, great mm -hmm. article, too, right there about uh, veterans find refuge to the complex. If there, you really can see the programs are coming around for homeless veterans from when you first started. True? Absolutely, absolutely. And I've seen, you know, the VA has been a big piece of that, but even more, we've depended on the community partnerships we've developed with, um, you know, city and state governments, with uh, community agencies. I've seen a bunch pop up in the, in the chat right here, uh, for, especially for our justice-involved vets. Um, I think that's great, and that's that's what it's going to take in order to, you know, in order to, like, effectively solve this, this issue. And then on the active duty side, again, as we alluded to, they're doing a phenomenal job of making sure anyone that's leaving under any cause uh, with the military service, that they're uh, provided those resources are, and assessed if they're at risk for that homeless aspect. So that's a phenomenal part. Um, we're ending up our time, but that means we get to shift into asking, uh, answering questions. Uh, and then if you want to go ahead and make a point about the, the slide for help with homeless veterans. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I've again, I've seen on the chat come up, and I've seen uh, some 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 colleagues uh, share this information. Um, but the VA has really, uh, you know, enhanced what they call a, a no wrong door approach, meaning that um, there's this hotline that's here on the screen um, that folks can call 24 hours a day, uh, seven days a week, and it's um, answered through a national call center, and then gets routed out to local providers. So for example, um, I get an email every day when someone calls in, in our region here in New York City, and I reach out to that veteran and share with them resources that I know about here on the ground. Um, and so again, if you, you know, see someone on the street, on the train, um, if you know someone just in, you know, in your, your general life going around, um, make sure that you let them, them know that that resource is there. Yeah, that's, that's even more powerful than, you know, if they're asking for money or just a prayer, you can see individual signs. You can actually provide them that phone number and equip them to make that call. It can make all the difference, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Great. Hey, great chat with you. I can tell that there are a lot of folks interested in what you and I are talking about, so we'll turn it over and uh, we'll field questions. Great. So please stay on camera. So. Um First of all, thank you so much for this wonderful talk and um, for sharing this great information. It's really been useful. And now we're going to make it super interactive by asking questions. So I will read out questions to you, and then maybe you can do a hand up or something to say who's going to answer it so that we don't have you both talking at the same time. <laughs> so uh, we've got a question from Ali Lowenstein. Are the resources like TAP and In Transition available for longtime vets? Uh, yes, Ali, especially the in transition program. Uh, TAPS, again, is now congressionally mandated for those who are leaving military service by retirement or by deciding to separate or being separated. So that is set. In transition, they're really starting to push out the marketing of availability. So thank you for being part of that and getting that information out to other people. So uh, Raina Ramirez asks, if I'm a landlord and have vacancies in my building, what uh, programs are there to provide housing in this way? <laughs> Rachel. Uh, yes. Um, uh, Raina, that's a great question. Um, and again, that's where we really depend on our partners in the community, like local landlords, um, to help address uh, the crisis around affordable housing. Um, a program like uh, my friend over there, Josh, has mentioned, um, Hudvesh is um, you know, is a nationwide subsidy program, and so you can contact your local housing authority, and you can just find them online, Google HUD uh, housing authority, and let them know that you have properties available and you would like to participate. Um, and it's a pretty easy process. Uh, you know, you pr provide some tax information so that they can uh, find a way to pay you, and uh, you go from there. That's great. So Ali has another question. This number that we have up on the slide, is it good in states outside New York? 
Um, that's also a good question. Yes, it's a, it's a national hotline. Um, and so it's, again, staffed by uh, VA social workers across the country. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, it's staffed by folks in Hawaii, Alaska, continental US. Great. Uh, Tina asked earlier, what year was TAPS created? Hey, uh, Tina, thanks. I, I actually got a chance to look at that, so I looked it up to make sure I wasn't make, giving out false information. Uh, it, is, it is a program that exists well over the last 25 years, but it's only in the last couple of years, especially when Congress mandated it, that it has really become successful and, and, and directed the integration of uh, the Department of Labor and how to search for jobs, how to change uh, your view of culture. Because uh, in the military, uh, you don't apply for the jobs you're looking for, you get assigned to them. And then also, more importantly, in this situation, the housing and urban development individuals part of TAP to help assess and assist those who are heading toward in, uh, uncertain housing conditions. So great question. Um, Annika Werner Gavrin asks, does the VA have any resources for vets with hoarding disorders who have recently transitioned to permanent housing? Uh, thanks, Annika. That, that's a great question and a very timely one. Um, you know, as we know, uh, much of hoarding is really related to management of anxiety. Um, yeah. And so, uh, again, speaking from experience, um, I've seen the VA offer a lot of uh, trainings uh, for clinical social workers um, who are going out into people's homes. So, um, for example, in HUD-VASH, but I've seen it with transitional housing programs as well. Um, so rather than kind of the old clean sweep model, um, working with folks kind of step by step to helping, um, you know, understand the hoarding behavior and then working to uh, reduce it. Um, so, so yeah, that's that's how that's get assisted with hoarding disorder. Yeah, great. So we have a question from earlier. Um, Franklin, we had a client who was in prison for many years, and his DD-214 and any discharge documentations he had were transferred to the correction department. However, when he was released after two decades, they lost his document. The challenge there was that this client had served long before the military had their new filing system, and it's been a challenge for him to prove his service. What can he do? Yeah, absolutely. I, um if they haven't already tried that link and contacted the office directly that I put on that previous slide, uh, and if that's not the case, I would actually encourage them to get a hold of their congressman or their senator's offices. They always have that constituent care and have them jump in on that part. Because keeping medical records in the depository in St. Louis, uh, long, long stories, but getting <laughs> congressional or senate support on finding something that that's old is probably going to be really critical. So I'd say go to the link first. If that's not successful, go to the senator or the congressman's congressional care office. And they can help cut through a lot of logistical and dust. Take. I mean, they're going to have to literally find a piece of paper in the depository. So it's a great idea to be ready. <laughs> Glad, thanks for asking. That's a very noble effort and worth it. Uh, and I wish them well. So Eliza's got a question. I actually don't know if either of you know this, but um, what are some of the differences between male and female veterans, specifically in regards to their transitioning process? I, I could take that one from what we're from what we're finding right now, and then I'll turn it over to Rachel on how it looks after they're out. Uh, the differences are, are certainly specific to identity, as I alluded to before. We do appear that a lot of the males in the military really adapt that as their identity, whereas the females uh, are, are by the. I don't have the actual research in front of you, but I understand from what it said is the females are more into this is the next phase of my life. This is where I want to go, and this is what I want to be, and they're thinking of other ways to identify. So that is the biggest challenge, is just putting down the glory aspect that they got from uh, their service. Uh, we may also look at... Um, just one of the other pointed issues is has sexual assault occurred to males or females during their time, uh, what's called MSA, military sexual assault. If that if that is present, then there's a whole other path in how men and women are going to relate to themselves outside of the military. Uh, statistically, it's not um, it's not a, a large issue, but we recognize that each MSA is actually a tragedy in itself. So I wanted to kind of open up that door on it. Depends on what exactly happened during their service time, but uh, overall it's just the identity that they're taking away from there. Rachel, anything you'd see on your side? 
Yeah, just um, a couple of other differences I've noticed. Um, you know, male veterans tend to be more likely to be uh, married and Caucasian. Um, female vets I've worked with tend to be unmarried and tend to be women of color. Um, and so, you know, there's different stuff that comes along with that. I've also tended to see um, more of the female vets I've worked with have young children at home. And so I think to some degree that that forces a, a woman to adjust faster, um, yeah. to, um, you know, make compromises or exhibit some flexibility to kind of take what they can get because they're oftentimes not just responsible for themselves but responsible for children as well. Oh, well spoken. Yeah. So this question has Rachel's name in it. So you don't have to raise your hand. <laughs> um, <laughs> can non-HUD VASH clinicians access the VA trainings that you were referring to? That is a good question. And I again, I can't uh, speak with any kind of official designation. Um, I do know that some of the trainings that I that I pulled for the resources for this presentation, I just Googled. Um, or I guess you could use any search engine. I don't want to privilege one over another. <laughs> um, but, but some are specific, um, you know, and, and kind of in-house on, on our intranet. Um, so I, I, would, I would look around, see what's out there, um, and also try to network with, uh, with your local VA social workers. There it is. There it is. If I could just jump on that, I happen to know the VA does have both internal and external trainings. And so it is just a matter of getting a hold of the VA. Uh, through their website or uh, through getting to know a local VA social worker and they can let you know which ones are for the general population. There's definitely a benefit on behalf of the VA on making sure that civilian providers are also aware of veteran issues. So that's a great, great question. Uh, in fact, we use them a lot. Uh, the military is certainly allowed to use VA, test, uh, VA training and it's just phenomenal stuff. Hmm. The Tanya Dawson asks, does a vet lose his or her benefits upon conviction of a crime and serving prison time? I can answer that, I guess, a little bit more, maybe. Um, my understanding um, is that if a veteran is incarcerated for longer than 90 days, uh, they will temporarily lose their uh, medical and financial benefits um, because someone can't receive uh, medical benefits from two federal agencies at the same time. Um, however, um, the VA does have uh, social workers in place so that when someone is uh, transitioning out of a uh, corrective environment, um, we help to reinitiate their medical care and their uh, financial benefits. Yeah, I would just add that it, it always depends on, it, it, with that point that she makes, but it is always back to the DD-214 on if mm -hmm. they were court-martialed or received non-judicial punishment and lost the right to veterans' benefits. So it's always contingent on what the specifics are, uh, how they left the military. Uh, with the exception of in transition, that that uh, I'll throw that one back in there. Uh, that one is irregardless because we still want to take care of the mental health issues of individuals who have ever been active duty. Yeah. So Lindsay Eisencraft asks, what challenges or opportunities present themselves when working with veterans as not only a civilian but also a female? Do you find any significant differences when working with older veterans versus veterans from the GWOT? Well, can I, global War on Terrorism, just in case Thank folks you. aren't really aware Thank on you. that one, but go ahead. Thank you, Franklin. Um, sure. Yeah, I, you know, it's interesting because I, I do find that I have to monitor, um, you know, the role of transference and countertransference a lot more. Um, you know, I feel like sometimes there's like a sisterly thing that happens, sometimes, you know, especially for the older, you know, Vietnam era vets, um, you know, I feel like I do kind of, um, there are times that I am kind of meeting, uh, you know, their, veterans are sharing their experiences with me in a way that they may not be able to with their own uh, daughters or sons. Um, I would also say that I have to be very mindful about the boundaries that I have with folks. Um, you know, uh, Franklin, I think, talked earlier about the masculine culture that happens uh, in service, and so I am pretty clear with folks about what appropriate behavior looks like, you know, while we're working together. Um, and I also think that race plays a big part of that too. Um, 
there have been times that I have been assigned to work with a new veteran who was maybe previously working with a female colleague of mine who is also a woman of color, and they automatically assume that I'm, uh, you know, a supervisor or something like that. And um, you know, it, it's just it's fodder that I that I use peer supervision for. I talk with my my clinical supervisor about uh, to manage some of those things. Thank you for sharing that. So we've got a question from BJ. Is there separate funding streams for veterans needing services, such as home care, housekeeping, homemaking, or Meals on Wheels, or transportation, or heavy-duty cleaning? And are these services available prior to age 62? Um, you know, I'm not sure about the requ the age requirement. Um, I did see in the chat earlier someone mentioned uh, aid in attendance, um, which is an additional financial benefit uh, for qualified veterans to help with um, with some of those things. Uh, if you know a veteran can no longer uh, you know maintain their house um, or maintain uh, you know meal preparation, but they do tend to have need to have other uh, difficulties with other activities of daily living in order to qualify. Um, Franklin, do you do you know any more about that? I was watching the chat. You caught me. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Um, uh, yeah, <laughs> we were just talking about different kind of home care uh, services oh. and whether the VA assists and if there is an age requirement on that. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm I'm a little limited in that aspect. Uh, I'm not that familiar with that one. I apologize. Yeah, I, I will say that uh, veterans I've worked with have been able to utilize. Um, some of the same resources that are there for civilians, like uh, Meals on Wheels. Um, and uh, again, depending on someone's level of service connection, um, you know, they may be able to, uh, to qualify for some other additional, like home health care uh, that's paid for by the VA. Yes, that's a means-tested program. So I got it now. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. OK, so I'm looking for my next question. Um, Tanya has a clarifying question. She's asking if the prison time crime is committed or served after they've separated from military services, does that impact their ability to access veteran services? Um, no, not not in my experience. Um, I, it depends a little bit upon the nature of the crime. Um, you know, uh, for example, in uh, Hudbash, we are not able to work with veterans who are on the lifetime sex offender registry. Um, but for other, you know, any other, you know, misdemeanor or felony that I can think of, um, you know, we are able to work with them. Um, and again, that, um, you know, there is a congressional mandate for the VA to provide care for all eligible veterans. And so, you know, we can't turn someone away because of an act committed after their service. Yeah, after, exactly. Yep. Grace asks, what are some of the characteristic differences to highlight with recent vets in this wartime, and does the VA offer much in terms of PTSD treatment? Franklin, you want to talk a minute about yeah. kind of transitions yeah. and what you see, and then I can talk a little bit about programs. Absolutely. Um, just for the sake of the military and transition, this is a more social media connected uh, generation than we've ever had. Uh, thinking about that the the folks right now that are separating are generally younger because they're not they're not staying for a full retirement. They're maybe joining for the purpose of college, uh, money, or to explore about themselves, being involved in active duty, be it deployments, and then separating. So this is an interesting generation we're still trying to figure out in the military about how social connected they are, but not necessarily emotionally connected. Uh, we can give an example at uh, an Air Force base, an individual put out on social media their intent to kill themselves uh, because of some things were going on in their life. They got 32 likes, uh, and no one reached out to them. And so it's that whole thing we're still trying to get a handle on about social connections. Because that lends to when you leave the military, there is not that unit cohesion aspect, and that can be uh, uh, even further isolating when someone's reaching socially and not getting any emotional connection. I uh, hope that's okay for the lead-in to the second part with, with the VA. Yeah, yeah, um, yes. I mean, folks are coming back and getting diagnosed with PTSD in uh, record numbers. Oh, gotcha. And so, um, again, my experience uh, is that, um, you know, VAs I've, I've 
interacted with uh, have had a specific PTSD clinic uh, that provides individual and uh, uh, group therapy. Um, and there's a number of different, you know, approaches. Um, some um, some things I've been able to participate in are just very basic, like coping skills um, that um, you know that most folks can benefit from. And then you have more specialized uh, treatments like um, uh, cognitive processing therapy, um, uh, like uh, prolonged exposure therapy. Um, uh, EMDR is another kind of emerging. Uh, treatment for folks, um, and so uh, yeah, there's there's a, a lot of um, kind of provided interventions out there. Uh, the VA is also continuing to do a lot of research um, so that we can continue to offer you know the best care possible. I, I missed the PTSD part, so let me just add one other part of that. Yeah, there's no question, especially for individuals that are deployed. Uh, the military has put in what's called a post-health uh, deployment assessment. It is it uh, occurs right after you leave, uh, 30 days, and then nine months after. Now the challenge, of course, is they if you separate, they're going to try and find you to do that nine months. But if any point in there you trigger for uh, underlying mental health matters, post-traumatic stress, that means you are uh, connected with mental health, and so that those therapeutic interventions that you just referenced, Rachel, can occur while still on active duty, or make sure that the documentation is there and passed along to the VA so that there can be continuity in care. Mm -hmm. um, one thing I would like to add real quick, though, is you know I, I think sometimes we can get a little deficit-based when it comes to folks coming home, um, and there's research coming out of um, Yale Medical School and the New Haven VA um, that's looking at the concept of post-traumatic growth, and they yes. found that 70% um, of veterans who uh, meet the criteria for PTSD also experience uh, some aspects of post-traumatic growth, um, where they have either um, you know an enhanced connection uh, to other people, um, you know, an enhanced sense of their own uh, kind of role and self-worth, um, an enhancement in religiosity or kind of a spiritual sense of meaning. And so, um, yeah, I would just like folks to, to kind of hold on to that as well. You know, you can have PTSD, but also experience growth. Great perspective, yeah. Mm -hmm. So we're coming to the close of our session here, but Eliza asked about um, alternative forms of treatment, and this relates to this um, Warrior Transition Brigade <laughs> service dog slide that we have here. <laughs> so there are alternative forms of transition. I don't know if either of you want to comment on any of them. Uh, um, go ahead. Sorry. I mean, I, I've seen um, alternatives. I actually see a lot of service animals in the VA um, from, you know, eight pound <laughs> little dogs to, you know, 80 pound pit bulls. Um, and so, uh, you know, there are, I feel like there are adaptations like that. I've also seen uh, recreational therapy play a big role to continue to reduce isolation. I see equine therapy coming up now. Yep. Um, you know, uh, there's there's just a lot out there. I've also seen acupuncture. Um, you know, the VA continues to um, enhance offerings around mindfulness uh, and mindfulness-based stress reduction because um, a lot of veterans don't like some of the sedating effects that may come from um, you know sleeping medication or uh, painkillers. Uh, yep, yoga is another big one. Yes, I'm going to type it as well, but mindfulness and yoga are definitely taking off in the active duty aspect as well because it does give you that sense of, of centeredness. Uh, and so, yes, yeah, everything you've said plus uh, just emphasis on those for what we do for individuals before they separate or retire from the military. Mm -hmm. Great. All right, well, we're at 158, so I'm just going to show a couple closing slides here. So I want to share that we do have some resources at Columbia School of Social Work regarding veterans, and we're going to have these slides available for you to download. Um, we also have resources for students who are veterans or active duty military, and we have some links regarding homelessness, military culture, and public service loan forgiveness. And if you want further reading or if you want to check our references, we've got those on the slides as well. So I'm going to put back up this uh, resources slide and take us to our wrap-up layout here where you can download this resource. And I'm going to upload the slides as well so you can download them here.
So I really want to thank um, Rachel Waltz, one of our esteemed alumni, and Franklin Lieutenant, Lieutenant Colonel Franklin Swain, one of our esteemed <laughs> online instructors, for donating your time today and all the dress rehearsals and the practice and the putting together these resources. <laughs> It's really been wonderful to work with you. And I want to thank everybody who attended today. There was so much great resource, resource sharing in the chats, and I saw contact information being exchanged and resources being exchanged. So that was really wonderful, and we really appreciate that you did that. Honored. Thank you. Yeah, it was my pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you. Oh, good. Post-traumatic growth is something to talk about for the future. And, uh... <laughs> mm -hmm. Aging issues, of course. That's a great point. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Great. So we can stick around for a few moments. Someone did ask about employment through the VA. Uh, it, it has its own hiring practice. So the best thing to do is to go to USA Jobs or VA Jobs. I think it's – I've got to check out the VA website, but I know it's USA Jobs. Uh, yeah. That, yeah. Go ahead. So, yes, it is uh, usajobs.gov. There it is. Uh, Pretty easy to use. You can upload documents as needed. Um, and again, I, you know, we kind of alluded to this earlier, but um, I would definitely encourage folks who are interested in working with veterans um, to remember that veterans are individuals first and foremost and have had many of the same life experiences and struggles that we all have. And so find that thing that you're passionate about and do it well um, and then you know, use that in the way that you serve vets. Great. Mm -hmm. All right, just looking to see if there's anything else we can cover for folks here in the final moments. Thank you for your All feedback. Right. We hope that we will see you at these future online events. Yeah, it's great. Thank you, Stacy. Appreciate that. People can uh, po uh, send a note to you personally about the hiring, uh, non-competitive hire. Especially in the Colorado Springs area. <laughs> I got nine more months till I retire. It's all right. <laughs> wow. Such <Central> a liar. <laughs> nine months. It's far from uh, being retired on active duty. Uh, it's funny. Well, you can't retire from teaching online. So well, it's not gonna that'll, be. that'll be great. Yep. Thank you very much. Yep. <laughs> okay, anything about the... Oh, I uh, think attaching a, a signature from my class. Hey there, CC. Yay! <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> um, BJ's asking, do you have advice for how to attach a signature to the two eight five zero C forms? Um, I believe that's like the healthcare professional form. Stacy may be able to assist with this. Um, but what I typically do is print it, hard copy, sign it, and then uh, scan it back in. Can you use phones for that? Is that allowed with the government? Like, by scanning, can you just take a picture with your phone? <laughs> there have definitely been times I've done that in a pinch. I've done it, yes. <laughs> yes. Mm -hmm. All right. Looks like uh, it's all gearing down then. So, wow, you guys did an amazing job with everything, the pictures and... Mm -hmm. Yeah. This is great. Yep. Well, thank you, everybody. We really appreciate your time. Great. Thank you. Thank you.